So, with Pastor Eric out, uh, we, we had to kind of scramble and get a guest speaker for today. So our guest speaker is actually me. How you doing? <laughs> What's up? <laughs> yeah. Hi. Awkward. <laughs> yeah. I uh, got, got, the, got, the, got the notice on Friday night. I was up at um, youth retreat. So hanging out with a bunch of high schoolers and middle schoolers, actually me and uh, John, the worship leader, and a bunch of other uh, helpers were all up there hanging out with middle and high school kids. And let me tell you something, it's been a little while since I was hanging out with middle school kids, and I kind of forgot. <sighs> I kind of forgot how funky that room can smell. <laughs> <laughs> you put like 14 middle school boys in one room, baby. That's like a cornucopia of odor. <laughs> like Axe body spray, body odor, <laughs> unidentified, whew, whatever that is. Yeah. <laughs> but but we, man, we, had a, we had a really good time. Uh, they're going to be back here. They're probably about to start their way back down from New Hampshire uh, pretty soon here. They're, they'll be back here today, I think between 3 and 4 o'clock. Um, I had the, the, the privilege of, of hanging out and just really uh, keeping an eye on everything. And one of the things that I got to see on my way out uh, as I was leaving last night, we came back last night, we left at like nine o'clock, came here. Um, one of the things I got to see was, was I was passing, going to get my bags actually to leave. And I, and I came into a room where it was all the high school kids and they were all in like this little lounge area and they were sitting down together. It was like 20 or so kids and they were all together and it was really quiet. And how many of you know, if teenagers are really quiet, something's probably up. So I, I, I was like, whoa, and I, and I kind of stood in the corner, and they didn't know that I was there, and I was kind of just listening. And there was these kids that were just talking to each other in like this circle, and they were talking about crazy stuff. Like, like I was listening to some 16-year-old girl, 17-year-old girl, and she was talking about what, what she felt like it meant to, to count the cost to follow Jesus. Then I was listening to another kid, one of, the, one of the high school boys, and he was talking about how he really loves retreat to be able to get away for a weekend, to be with other kids his age, and to be seeking God together. And I was in the corner listening to that. I didn't even pay them to say that. I was like, whoa, this is, this is, this is amazing. It was a really cool moment. So they're, they're, they, I hope they're, they're still having a good time. I believe that they are. But as far as I know, man, it was a, it was a real good weekend. I had myself a, a great little time. And um, yeah, I'm glad to be back. So uh, today... I'm going to, to speak about a, a story that maybe you guys have heard before. Maybe, maybe it's familiar to you. Maybe you've been in church for a while. And I find that, that, you know, I've been in church for a while at this point. I didn't grow up in church, but I've been in church a while for this point. And sometimes you hear, like, stories. They come up. You know, it's Bible stories, right? Like, for example, say you were a child in kids' church. How many times between kids' church and, say, 50 years old do you think you heard about Adam and Eve if you stayed in church all the time? A lot, right? You hear about Adam and Eve quite a bit. And there's some other stories in the Bible where you maybe hear them quite a bit. And uh, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be dealing with a, a familiar story. But I believe, as somebody who's got some years in the Lord now, I believe that if we just kind of continue to scratch the surface on some of these, on some of these stories that we, maybe we've heard many times before, we start to scratch the surface. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's a little bit deeper. And you scratch and you scratch. And then like the story is like deeper. And then you're like digging. And you're like, it just keeps going. Because God is so deep. How many of you know that you can read that word? And you can read those stories like all the time for years. People study those stories for years. And after years, they're still pulling new things out of those stories. Because if God is as great as we sing that he is, that's how deep and inexhaustible his wisdom is. So today we're going to be talking about the story of Lazarus. And I want to give just a, a quick backstory before we start with his story. Jesus has been in Jerusalem with his disciples, and he has just healed a man born blind. And he healed a, a man born blind. And you would think everybody's like celebrating, like, yeah, go Jesus. Yeah, this is awesome. That guy was born blind, and now he can see. Well, instead we see that they actually re react in the opposite way. They, they eventually pick up stones and they're ready to kill Jesus. It was actually the, the religious leaders of his day, they really enjoyed the people coming to them for direction and telling them how great they are, right? We sing, how great are you, Lord? But the danger for us pastors and religious leaders sometimes is we like to hear how great we are, you know what I'm saying? It's true. 
So these religious leaders back in the day, they really like to hear how great they were. And Jesus shows up on the scene and starts healing people. And instead of the people coming to them, now they're going and following Jesus. There's like, they're so deathly jealous that now they want to kill Jesus. And that's the backstory for the story of Lazarus. They pick up stones to kill Jesus. And Jesus and his disciples, they end up leaving town. So, We'll pick it up here, the story of Lazarus, John 11, verse number 1. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So there's three of them, two sisters, Mary and Martha, and there's Lazarus, the brother. This is the same Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. How many of you ladies know that you really got to love a man to put your hair on his feet? I don't know nothing about that. But I can imagine it's got a little bit of a, you, you got to really love that person, right? Wiped his feet with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the two sisters, they sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Well, a lot of people go to Jesus, right? A lot of people come to Jesus. They hear about him. They, they want to come. They're trying to bring their, their sicknesses or their sick friends or whatever. And there may be strangers to Jesus. He met a lot of people he didn't know that were still looking for some help from him. But in this situation, in that scripture, it says his dear friend. They said, Jesus, your dear friend, Lazarus, is sick. There's a connection there. He knows these guys. Your dear friend, Lazarus, is very sick. And let me ask you, well, what, do you, what would you do if someone sent for you and said, one of your dear friends or your loved ones is sick, come quickly. What are you going to do? You're going to drop everything and you're going to go, right? But let's read what Jesus does. Uh, verse number four, when he heard this, Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loves them all. The dear friend who knows them, they send for Jesus. They, Jesus, come quick. Our brother Lazarus is so sick to the point of death. Please come quick. And Jesus does exactly what you and I would do if someone told us our dear loved one was sick to the point of death. It says that, he stayed where he was for two more days. And verse number six, when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Why? Why would he do that? You and I would go running. Why would Jesus stay two more days? And then he says to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Let's go back to where we just came from. Let's go back to the place where they were just picking up stones to try and kill me. Let's go back to that same place. And you're going to see here, you're going to see here, you're going to see here that, uh, that the disciples are not thrilled with this idea. But one of the things I want to draw attention to here is that Jesus does the opposite of what we would expect. We would come running. He took his time. It's not the first time that Jesus does this. It's not the only time that Jesus does this. In fact, God seems to work on his own timing. Anybody ever experienced that before? Sometimes we're praying for something in our timing, and God's like, hmm. Jesus, there's a story of a, of a guy who has a little daughter that is sick to the point of death as well. This guy's name is Jairus, and Jairus goes to find Jesus. And I, and I actually hate this story, to tell you the truth, because I have two little girls and it like breaks my heart to think about this story and what Jairus is feeling in this moment. It just does. It freaks me out. And uh, Jairus, who has a little girl who's sick to the point of death, goes to find Jesus and says, Jesus, please come with me. My daughter is sick. Please come with me. And Jesus agrees. So Jairus finds Jesus over here. And they're going to Jairus' house to bring Jesus to his daughter that maybe he will do something and maybe she will get better. And on the way, Jesus is stopping and talking to all of these people. People are coming up to Jesus asking for prayer. People are coming up to Jesus trying to touch the hem of his robe, trying to get healing for themselves. And Jesus is stopping and having conversations and little teaching moments. And I can just put myself in the shoes of Jairus, man, with my little girl at home sick. And this guy has agreed to come with me. I put all my hope in this basket. And he has 
stopped and he's talking to other people. He's not coming with me and my time and my speed. I got there first. I got there first, Jesus. Don't pray for that lady. I don't care about that lady. I care about what's going on in my life. So I think today what I'm going to try and do is, is bring out a couple of lessons from the story of Lazarus. Let's say seven lessons from Lazarus. And the first lesson I think we can see here in the story is that it may not be on our time, but God is always on time. And we struggle with this, right? I struggle with this. We struggle with this. The disciples struggle with this. The people around him struggle with this. And I wonder, I wonder if Lazarus struggled with this too. Because Lazarus is in bed, right? He's sick for a while. He's laid out in bed and maybe he's in the storm of his life. The sickness of his life has come upon him out of nowhere. And he's laying down and he hears that his sisters are sending for his dear friend Jesus about who maybe he's heard rumor is a miracle working man. And they send word to Jesus and Lazarus is laid out in his sick bed, waiting, waiting for Jesus to come. And as he's waiting for Jesus to answer that prayer, if you will, waiting for Jesus to show up, he can just see that hope and that light getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until he's there on his bed and with his last breath, Jesus never shows up. It may not be on our time, but God is always on time. Lazarus was in that great storm, and maybe you are in a storm. Maybe you are in a place. Maybe you're sick or in need. Maybe we need to trust today in God's goodness that even if we're crying out to him, even if we're calling out to him, if we're praying, and we're saying, Lord, that you will help me in my moment of need, and we sit there, and maybe we hit our knees, and maybe we're crying out, and we're saying, God, and there's real tears from our eyes. We're praying for our mom. We're praying for our loved ones. And it seemed like God has taken forever. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've prayed for people who died. And I got to square that in my heart with singing about great are you, Lord, that I just did a funeral for this kid or whatever. How do you square those things? That's heavy, but that's real life stuff, is it not? Can we be a little bit real? Is it Okay. Or do we need to like do the Christianese, everything's great, hallelujah, whatever, whatever. Blessed and highly favored. And then we go out to our car and that's when real life starts again. So let's go back to that, go back to that uh, story. Verse number seven picks up and then he tells his disciples, let's go back to Judea. They don't like this. The disciples are a little bit freaked out because they remember that there's people trying to kill him. They were just there. So we see the disciples say, Rabbi, a little while ago, these people there were trying to stone you. They were trying to kill you. And now you want to go back? This is like a low-key challenge to Jesus. Are you sure, Jesus, that you want to do this? Are you sure this is the right plan, Jesus? Are you sure we're, you're leading us in the right direction right now, Jesus? Because it sounds sketchy. It sounds dangerous. And Jesus answers them. He answers that little challenge, and it's a little bit cryptic. He says, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anybody who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Now, that sounds cryptic. It sounds a little bit interesting, but I think we've got to read between the lines there. The disciples are probably scared, not just for Jesus, but for their own lives. You really want to lead us back into the lion's mouth from what we just barely escaped, Jesus? Are you sure that's the plan? Jesus samples their simple question, maybe their simple challenge with his answer. And he's brought this up before, talking about the light, talking about moving in the daylight or whatever. He's brought this up before in scripture. He says in John 9, he says, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me, God. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. What's the darkness going to do if I'm the light of the world, right? What's the darkness going to do if you have the light of the world with you? What's darkness going to do when the light of the world now turns around and says, you are the light of the world? What if you're carrying that flame inside of you? 
and you're walking through this life and you know that life is full of struggle, but you got that flame inside you, that light of the world inside of you. Do you understand that there's nothing that death or destruction or the enemy can do to you if you have that light inside of you? And I believe that that's what Jesus is telling them. He's saying, if, if, if God's for us, who can be against us? Who cares if we're going back in the lion's mouth? There's somebody over there that needs my help. We're going back. That brings me to my second point here. I think our second point from Lazarus. Wherever you go, bring the light with you and don't have to worry about the darkness because the light is stronger than the darkness. The darkness cannot comprehend or master over the light. So lesson number two of Lazarus is that the love of God is bold and for good reason. The love of God is bold. So let's go back into the lion's mouth, Jesus tells him. Let's go. Let's go. We have the light with us. We are the light of the world. We're going to go and we're going to face whatever darkness might be waiting for us. And we're going to come out on top. John eleven eleven. it goes on. After he said this, he went on to tell them a little bit about Lazarus. He says, our friend Lazarus. Let's go to John. Yeah. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples are very confused. They say, Lord, if he's asleep, he's going to get better, right? If he's asleep, he's going to get better. Why are we going to go and risk our lives if he's just sleeping? Well, Jesus, verse 13 says, Jesus had been speaking about his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, guys, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there. You see, now the plan is starting to unfold. There's a reason why he took two days before he moved when he was being called for help. He says, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Let's go to him now. Let's go. You know, the disciples are clearly a little bit confused. Jesus is talking about sleep, but he really means death. And they're like, what are you talking about? But that's something that, that human beings, whether you've heard it or not, human beings have recognized for thousands of years. There was this like ancient Greek poet, very famous. Homer Simpson was named after him. He's that famous. Homer, he was a Greek, uh, Greek poet. He said that sleep and death are twin brothers. He was from thousands of years ago. There's a more modern poet from the 90s, a little hip-hop artist I used to like, his name was Nas. He said, I never sleep because sleep is the cousin of death. And you have two poets, if you will, from thousands of years apart, and they're both seeing the same thing, that there's a relationship. There's a connection in a way between sleep and death. And there's a reason for that. It's because God has made creation and the things that happen in this creation, like his great evangelist, it all points back to something special about the Lord. Romans 1.20 says, Forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see God's invisible qualities. His eternal power, his divine nature. You ever looked at a sunset and just been blown away by some clouds and some colors? And you're like, how in the world can this be just like gases and chemicals and millions, billions or whatever of years? Because creation is God's great evangelist. It's pointing back to God and saying there is a master who has drawn and illustrated and made and created and breathed life into this whole place. And the funny thing is that we get blown away because we start thinking about, wow, the depths of the ocean and like these were those squiggly creatures that live down there. And we look at mountains and we're blown away because they're huge compared to us. We look at skies and sun and stars and moon and we say, wow, those things are amazing. Those things are amazing, but God's got a plot twist in his scripture. Out of all the things that he created, the one thing that he ever calls his masterpiece is actually you. It says, you're his masterpiece. The word in Greek is poema from where we get poem. You're like his beautiful poem. Isn't that crazy? He had all the things that he created. He calls you his masterpiece. So Nas and Homer, they were both right, right on the edge of perceiving a great truth about God through how he ordered his creation. Sleep and death are related. 
The Bible refers to death as sleep and sleep as death. Multiple times all through the Bible, it talks about it. Sleep and death, they're like interchangeable. And I want to push it a little bit further. Let's say 1 Thessalonians 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who what? Sleep in death. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Have you ever met somebody that doesn't have any hope? I know people right now that have no hope and they're terrified of death. They're terrified. They live their whole lives terrified of death because they think when they close their eyes in this life, that's it. And they done. It's lights out forever and it's just gone. So they're terrified of losing this while they have it. And when somebody close to them passes away, they're like, they're like inconsolable because they just think it's just gone. There's nothing. You're gone. You're winked out of existence forever. They live in fear of death. But one of the things that the Lord has promised us is that death for us is like sleep. It's like when you close your eyes at night and you lay your head on the pillow in the morning, you're going to open them and see that sun rise. And in the same way, God has made us a part of his like prophetic cosmic drama where we close our eyes in the night and we open them in the morning and we close our eyes in death and we will open them on the morning of Christ's arrival when the true light comes back into this world and calls us from our graves and all the graves death can't even stand before and we just pop out and we just see the true morning after which our mornings here are just a shadow and a symbol and a foreshadowing of the real true light. Isaiah, the Old Testament, this is a prophet. This is a man who was a prophet that he had the inspiration and spirit of God spoke to him. And he said this, he said, your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust. He's speaking to dead people here. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. That is the hope of the gospel. You're going to go into the dust, every single one of us someday, and you're going to rise. If you know the Lord and you have that light inside of you, you're going to rise and shout for joy because all the sickness and the sorrow and the death and the suffering that we experience here on earth, there's going to be nothing in comparison to that great Love and life that is in Jesus that awaits us on that day where death and destruction and sin and sorrow are gone and there's no more tears because they've all been wiped away. That's the hope of glory in Jesus. I may close my eyes to sleep at the end of this life, but baby, I know that the joy comes in the morning. The joy comes in the morning. That's our third takeaway from Lazarus here. The lesson, the joy comes in the morning. Someday, we're all, every single one of us got that same destiny in the ground there, but that joy is going to come when our eyes are open again in Christ. It's going to come in the morning. John verse 16, 11, 16. Then Thomas, one of the disciples, said to the rest of the disciples, he says, let's go. Let's also go with Jesus to this place where they're just trying to kill us. Let's just go with Jesus that we may die with him. They're really worried about what's going to happen back where they're going. They're really worried. On his arrival, they get there. Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany, where Lazarus is, was less than two miles from Jerusalem. They're literally right down the street from where these people were just trying to kill him. And it was just a couple of days ago. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary, they're all Jewish, to comfort them in the loss of their brother. They were all in the house. They were having a morning party. It was like a, it was not a party. They were having just like a morning time. They're all together and they were just grieving. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet them, but Mary stayed at home. And I'm going to repeat that because it's weird. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Didn't they both send for Jesus? Weren't they both love and friends of Jesus? How come only one went out to meet him? And we see it here, verse 21, what does she start with? The one that goes out to meet him. She starts here, let's read in between the lines of what she says. She says, Lord, first thing she says, Lord, Martha says to Jesus, if you had been here, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
First thing that she says to him, where were you when I called for you? Where were you when we reached out to you in our time of need, Lord? If only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then she musters up her faith. I believe she musters up her faith. And then she says, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. There's like some hope in her. She's almost there. She's almost got it. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I understand someday that he's going to rise again. And I want you to catch this. If you catch nothing else, really, this is a key point. Jesus says to her, it ain't about a day. Resurrection ain't so much a day as it is a person. The resurrection is a person. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He puts it to her. Do you believe this? She's struggling with disappointment. She's struggling with being let down by Jesus. She tells him to his face the first thing that she says when she sees him. Where were you? And he says... Do you believe this? Now let me ask you, do you believe this? Because I was in church sometimes where I didn't believe none of this. And there was other times in church where I was real lukewarm about it. I was like, yeah, whatever. I heard this a million times. Mm -hmm. Do you believe this? Because this is not just a word for the quote unquote good churchy people. This is a word for everybody, and I think it's put to each and every one of us. Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that the one who believes in me, even if they die, is going to live forever? Ask yourself, do you believe this? So she answers him, yes, Lord, in verse 27. She replies, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and she calls her sister. She goes and she gets Mary. She says, the teacher is here and is asking for you. Jesus had to ask for Mary. He had to go to her in her disappointment and call her back to him. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and she went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village. She was, he was still out there where he met Martha, right outside the village. So Mary gets up and he go, she goes to see him. All the people, verse 31, that had been in the house with her, comforting her, they noticed how quickly she popped up and went out. So they thought that she was going to Lazarus' tomb. So they all followed her to the tomb. They thought they were going to the tomb of Lazarus. So they all got up to follow her to the tomb of Lazarus and to go and mourn with her. And instead of going to the tomb, they go to the resurrection that is Jesus, the person in the flesh. And 32 says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. And what do you think she said? First thing, she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They are dealing with disappointment and doubt. They are dealing with all kinds of human emotions that if you're anything like me, you, are, you have crossed this or you're crossing maybe through it now. If only you had done this or done that, Jesus if only you'd showed up on time. If only you'd answered when I called. If only you just saw me in my despair and heard me as the tears streamed down my face, Lord, and I prayed for this person. If only that you showed up on time. I think a lot of us have these hidden resentments toward God and maybe don't even realize it. And I think similar to Mary here, we have a hard time understanding that Jesus is still at work even in the face of tragedy. That somehow even when things are bad, that God is still good. This is like the dilemma of man. If God is good, how come things can be bad? We have to remember that God is good and his ways are higher than our ways. He knows what's going on. And that brings us to lesson number five is that humans don't have the complete picture we can't see it all. We don't know the whole story. Someday, the Bible says that we're going to see face to face. Face to face. We're going to understand and see face to face with Jesus. It says that there's going to be a day where everything else fades away. And even our faith, I want you to hear, even our 
faith is going to be replaced because we're going to see him face to face. There's a great mystery in the Bible, and it talks about how the three greatest things are faith, hope, and love. And it says that love is the greatest. Can I tell you why love is the greatest? Because when we see Jesus, faith is not going to be necessary anymore because we have the real thing. Hope is going to be in front of us. It's going to be fulfilled right in front of us. Hope is going to be something that is fulfilled. There's nothing to hope for when you already got what you were hoping for. But love will remain forever because the scripture says that God is love. Faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest. Someday we're going to see face to face. We'll understand the whole picture. But for now, we only see in part. Verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, Mary weeping, and saw the other people wailing with her, something weird happens to Jesus. And a lot of like, a lot of ink has been spilled over the years. Like, why, why does it say this? Why, is Je- why does Jesus have a deep anger welled up with him? Why is he deeply angry? Why is he getting troubled, deeply troubled, it says. Jesus tells him, where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. And then Jesus wept. Shortest scripture in the Bible. Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby, they saw him crying for Lazarus. They said, see how much he loved Lazarus? He's crying so much. But others said, ah, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? In parentheses, if only he'd shown up on time. Do you see that common thread is a disappointment with Jesus? A disappointment with Jesus. Why is he weeping if he knows what he's about to do to Lazarus? If you're about to raise this guy from the dead, Jesus, why are you bothering weeping? He's emotionally moved. He's identifying with human suffering. He is not happy to see his people and his loved ones and his children, to see them going through destruction and sin and death and sickness. He doesn't like it. He takes no pleasure in watching us go through that. That's actually why he came to the world, because he couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't sit by and watch sin and death reign in this world. So he stepped into the world at ultimate cost to himself. And he gave his life to call us back to him, into that eternal life. He sees you. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're going through. And there's a lot of people in here right now that maybe need to be reminded of that. He knows what you're going through. He knows your situation. He knows how you're struggling with it. He knows how you're disappointed with him. He knows how it's making the waves, kind of doubting him. Am I really, oh, I don't know. He knows all that. He knows all that. Lesson number six here from Lazarus. He sees you. He knows what you're going through. God hates sickness and death. That's why he came into the world to, to do something about it. He hates it even more than you do because he loves you. You are like his masterpiece. Remember, like his poem. You are the beloved of God. Verse 38, remember he's angry. Verse 38 says he's still angry. Jesus is still angry. Before he said he was very angry. Now he's still angry as he arrives at the tomb. Why is he so angry? He arrives to the tomb. It's a cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. And he comes to the tomb, and he's, up, he's beyond upset. He's angry. And he's standing there, and he's looking at the stone in the tomb with the dead man inside. And he's come to the showdown between the author of life and the grave of death. And it's him and the grave. And that anger wells up inside him, that righteous anger. Roll the stone aside, he tells them. But Martha, the one that was just telling him, I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you're the son of God. Now she's got a protest. She's like, Lord, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We can't roll the stone aside. He's been dead for four days. The smell's going to be terrible. And Jesus responds, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe just trust me, Martha. 
Trust me, trust me, tr whatever your name is, trust me, trust me. You hear the words, you, you, you're able to say, yes, that's true and amen, but trust me, when it matters the most and that storm is threatening to swamp your boat, trust me. Jesus is in there with you. Verse 41, so they roll the stone aside. Dramatic scene, right? They're probably freaked out. I would have been freaked out. He's got a crowd of onlookers. They roll the stone away from a tomb where they're saying there's going to be stinky in there. And then Jesus looks up to heaven in front of all of them, looks up to heaven just like this. And he says, Father, thank you for hearing me in front of all these people. He says, you always hear me, but I say it out loud for the sake of all these people here so that they will believe that you have sent me. And then it says something interesting too. It says, then Jesus whispered, oh, Lazarus, come on out of the grave. Or Jesus was like, it's just normal talking. Lazarus, come out of the grave. What does it say? Yeah. Lazarus, come out of the grave! Yeah. I like it. I should have had that each other service. That was great. And those people probably didn't laugh like that. They're probably like freaked out even more, right? The tomb's open. Jesus is screaming for Lazarus to come out. And what happens? The dead man comes out and his hands and his feet are bound in grave clothes. His face is wrapped up in a head cloth. This guy comes out the grave, out the tomb. They roll the stone. A guy comes out. He's wrapped in grave clothes, and his face is covered, and he's walking out into the light. And Jesus tells them, the people with him, unwrap him and let him go. And if I was one of those people, I'd be like, you're talking to me? I'm not trying to touch that. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. But unwrap him and let him go. You see, Lazarus walked away from this whole thing. He walked away alive where he had been dead. His whole life, his whole life had changed forever. He actually becomes kind of famous. Later on in the scriptures, it has like stories about Lazarus being around and people are coming to like dinners where Lazarus is because they know that Lazarus was dead and he's been raised from the grave. So they're going to dinner and trying to like talk to Lazarus. What happened, man? What was it like? It changed Lazarus' life. It changed the people's lives that were around Jesus when he had Lazarus walk out the grave. And again, I think I would push it a little bit further and say, you were alive. You are alive now where you were once dead in the tomb in the grave before you knew Jesus, before the light of Christ shined in your life. If you're a believer like me, it's like you know that you was living in darkness and there was no, I didn't know nothing. I was hopeless I was without the Lord. I was just in that tomb, in that grave. I was just stuck there, sitting there. I didn't know nothing from nothing. And God in his mercy came to the stone over my tomb. And he called out to me and he said, Randy, get out of there. And his great light dawned in the darkness of my heart and my life. And he changed my life forever. And many of you got that same testimony where God has called you out of that darkness and into his marvelous light, has called you from the dead in your sins and brought you into life in Christ. Jesus is the author of life. He is the life giver. He is the resurrection. You're alive now where you were once dead and knowing Christ, your whole life has changed I believe that God wants to use us, people like that, so that other people are forever changed by what Jesus has done in our lives. We gotta be bold in our faith. We gotta go for it. We gotta stop caring about what other people think. What do they know? They don't even know the light from the darkness. Who cares? There's like eternal, eternity is at stake. Or maybe it's you that's in the tomb right now. Maybe your faith died due to something that wasn't fulfilled in your time. Maybe you know that feeling of crying and praying and crying and praying and running out of things to pray about because you feel like you've been praying that prayer for so long and you just lose hope. 
And then the doubt creeps in. And then the darkness starts to creep in on you. And you're like, God, maybe he's not good. Maybe he's not listening. Maybe he don't care. Because how can you see me going through this, Lord? You call me your child, God. How you see me suffering like I'm suffering, and yet you don't respond. I thought we were cool. I thought we were like that. I thought we were... I feel abandoned. I feel disappointed. That's what Mary and Martha are talking about, man. They felt abandoned in their time of need. They felt disappointed. Jesus, are you really our friend? We've been calling on you. We got to keep our eyes on the bigger picture. Jesus weeps with us in those moments. But I want to say that if disappointments have put your faith in the grave, maybe it's time to wake up. It's so it's time to wake up. The seventh lesson we take away is that it's time to take off them grave clothes. You're not dead no more. You don't have to feel unheard anymore. The Lord knows and sees that you struggle with disappointment. You struggle with doubt because you're calling and it doesn't feel like it's being answered in your timing. But trust me, God sees and hears and he's still good. If you've walked away from God because you felt like he's abandoned you, let's roll the stone away from over your heart today. Let's get free in the name of Jesus and leave the past behind. So Jesus, I just pray, God. I know this is a tough message, Lord. I know it's, it's tough to think about Stuff like this, God, but Lord, I thank you that you're moving in this place and you're moving in our lives and in people's hearts, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that this is a message that is a, a message in perfect timing for some people in here, God, that are struggling with disappointment and doubt, feeling like they're all alone in this thing. Maybe to the point where they struggle even singing about how great you are, Lord, because they're not sure anymore. It's more like great question mark, are you, Lord? Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you and remember that it may not be on our time, but you're always on time, Lord. That you are good, Lord. We don't see the whole picture, God. That we have the light, Lord. Darkness really can't do anything. Even if we die in this world, it's nothing. It's just an empty threat because we have you. That light can never be extinguished, God. That joy is going to come, Lord, because it's your promise. You are the resurrection, Lord. We believe, Lord. Help us in our unbelief. We believe, Lord. So if there's anybody in here who's in that tomb today, Lord, that you use an idiot like me, Lord. God, use me, Lord, to put your word out, Lord, to them, God. For your glory, Lord. Call them by name, Lord. Come out of that grave, my child. You've been sitting in that darkness long enough. And if you've never known Christ, if you've never known Christ, if it's just something that you just never have made that, you've, if you've never seen the light before like that and you are understanding right now that there's something to these scriptures that there's something to the name of Jesus, if this is the first time that the light of Christ is dawning in your heart, may this be the start of an amazing rest of your life, which is going to last eternity. Thank you, God, that you move like that, that you love like that, that you don't want to see us in sickness and death, that you've moved and entered into this world to do something about it, God, and you've given us the seal of your promise, God that you coming back for that final, final chapter where there ain't no more death because the sting of death is gone and there's no more sickness and every tear is gone, Lord. You are good, Lord, even in bad circumstance, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, help us to trust you even when we can't see the whole picture. Amen and amen.